Welcome to Construct Tech TV, and I'm Peggy Smedley. All year, we have been taking you inside smart cities and how they are built, from Pittsburgh all the way to San Diego. So for today's show, we're going to take a quick break from looking at one specific city, and instead, we're going to have an entire episode look at the future of construction. The show will focus on how construction is changing from commercial all the way to residential and from the office to the job site. On this segment of the show, I will give you my personal insights. So, but first, let me paint a picture for you just for a minute. You're at the job site. A machine is humming along next to you while it's laying bricks. Another is flying overhead, capturing data about what is happening on the job site. The connected tool in your hand is sending data to the back office about its whereabouts. At the same time, a 3D printer is producing components for your job. This is the job site I want you to imagine. I want you to visualize in your mind's eye this job site as we continue to talk throughout this entire episode. The good news is all this technology is actually here today. We have been talking about robotics, drones, and even 3D printing for years. And from what I can see, this isn't going to change anytime soon. Zion Market Research suggests digital transformation will continue to grow more than 19% between 2016 and 2021. In construction, we will see more automation at the job site and data will continue to attain exponential growth. We hear time and time again that this will help with collaboration and even decision making. And that is certainly true. But there is bad news. There are still some very real hurdles preventing us from getting there. The first is the lack of interoperability. Drones need to be able to talk to your enterprise system and integrate all the data from the back office processes. We need them to churn out the information you need when you need it. And we are witnessing some of these hurdles actually today. Another challenge is the lack of skilled labor in our construction industry. And I'm going to be very candid here. It's our responsibility as an industry to encourage the next generation to be excited about construction. And I would actually argue that it all starts with technology. There are two key ways technology can help. First, it can help make construction look cool. Skilled workers become more attractive when there are joysticks, drones, VR, AR, all of these things involved. And second, technology can actually help employees be more efficient on the job. We need technology more than ever before. So that's my two cents for today. The technology is here. The data is being generated at rates faster than ever before, but it's harder to implement and even manage. And that's precisely where we need to start. That's the future of construction. On today's Safety Zone, I'd like to talk about improving the safety on highway projects. Data from the BLS indicates from 2003 to 2015, 1,571 workers lost their lives on road construction sites. The number of fatal work-related injuries at road construction sites averaged 121 per year. To talk about this, I'm joined by David Fosbrook, statistician at the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. David, welcome to the show. Good afternoon. Thank you. So David, let's talk about some of the hazards workers are having on the highway and other zones that we talk about. Um, well, workers in road construction are exposed to a variety of hazards. Uh, of course, they drive over the road like the rest of us. So one of the hazards is being involved in motor vehicle crashes. Uh, the other involves major one involves being involved in vehicles running into workers um, or a variety of vehicle and equipment incidents such as rollovers and those sorts of things. So when you talk about this and you say that they're put into these hazardous situations, why are we seeing so many of these hazardous kind of situations happening 
on the roadways? Are we doing more things to protect them? Or is it just that this is kind of going to continue to happen because we have construction? Uh, that's really a two-part question, so I'm going to answer them in two different parts. Um, the nature of construction works puts workers in proximity to moving vehicles and equipment, the motorists that drive through the work zone, as well as operating dump trucks and loaders and, and other types of uh, paving equipment, for example. Uh, so that's kind of what places workers in those hazards. That doesn't mean that it's inevitable that we're going to have workers who are killed in roadway work zones. There are some things that can be done, and um, there are some things that NIOSH has looked at in the past, and there are things that industry is doing right now that are looking to improve safety for workers in work zones. So are we doing things right now? You said there are things that can be done. So what can be done to prevent you know, fatalities and even injuries in work zones? Okay, so when you look at um, the area that I've been doing most of my research in, it's been in the area of workers being struck by operating dump trucks and other types of construction equipment. One of the things you can do is make workers really aware of the visibility limits of the operator of that equipment. So if you have workers who are on the ground who have to work around um, moving equipment, the more they understand what the driver or the operator can see, the better. So NIOSH developed a series of blind area diagrams for, um, for dump trucks, for front end loaders, for uh, shuttle buggies and whatnot, different types of pieces of equipment. And we have them on our website. And those blind area diagrams can be used by construction companies as a training tool so that workers who are on the ground have a better idea of what are the equipment operators are having to deal with. So what actually are we talking about when you discuss these blind area diagrams? Are they specific locations on a construction site when you're talking about that? Actually, there are specific areas around an individual piece of a construction equipment where the operator cannot see either through direct line of sight or with the use of their mirrors, what's behind them. So this is one of the things you can do to help prevent people from being backed over by construction equipment. So it sounds like you could use that for training right now as these blind area diagrams. Absolutely, they can be downloaded off of our website and they can be used, for example, in toolbox talks. Some other creative things that some construction companies have done with the blind area diagrams are to take them and make a decal out of them so it serves as a reminder to ground workers. And another thing you can do is you can have those diagrams uh, drawn at scale to uh, scale construction equipment, you know, 1 to 32 scale or 1 to 50 scale construction equipment, so that you can lay that piece of construction equipment on top of that diagram and it gives a really nice visual for construction workers to see kind of, well, if I'm standing here, am I going to be able to see or not be able to see by the, uh, by the operator? So are there other things that you can suggest besides blind area diagrams that should be done when we're talking about using heavy equipment? Yes, uh, NIOSH began um, in 2001 looking at a couple of other interventions in highway construction work zones, one of which is the internal traffic control plan and the other are the use of proximity warning devices. And these are both strategies that have been used to try to reduce the exposure of workers on site to backing, um, or for that matter, even moving forward, construction of vehicles and equipment. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the internal traffic control plans first. Some of the basic premises of the internal traffic control plan are to limit the amount of backing that needs to take place on the job site by organizing the workflow on the, uh, on the job site. Another principle is to kind of minimize the conflict, if you will, or the, the amount of time that workers spend in the areas where equipment has to move. So those are just kind of a couple of examples. Um, and by setting up these internal traffic control plans, you can, again, reduce the amount of time that workers are where the equipment operators can't see them. Did you see uh, significant results by doing these? I mean, because you both of these kind of studies and plans that you have, are you seeing positive results by doing them? Uh, for the internal traffic control plans, we saw mixed results. So we went out to a series of seven sites, and we did um, the internal traffic control plan on seven sites, and on seven other sites we did what we call a control, where we did not have the internal traffic control plan implemented. And in a couple of those sites, we saw significant reductions of the amount of time that workers were exposed to uh, what we call the hazardous areas around pieces of construction equipment. In several other sites, we really didn't see any difference. 
And in one site, we saw an increase. Now, in spite of this kind of mixed result, we have found that there are some companies that are trying to refine those, those internal traffic control plan concepts so that they can try to improve safety on their job sites. Well, David, we're running out of time. Where can our viewers go to get more information and see these results and all the other things that you guys are doing right now? Sure. Um, NIOSH has a web page that's the Highway Work Zone uh, Safety web page. If you just Google NIOSH Highway Work Zone Safety, it will go direct you directly to the link. Um, well, David, thank you so much. David Fosbrook, you are the statistician at the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. Thank you so much for being with us today. You're most welcome. All right. That's our Safety Zone for today. After years of withstanding the elements, older buildings can succumb to wear and tear. But in that time, these buildings can become more than just structures. They become homes, landmarks, places of importance to entire communities. For example, like restoring a home at 604 Second Street in Brentwood, California. It is for this reason that the Carey Brothers Remodeling has accepted the challenge of bringing these historic and well-loved buildings into modern times. To tell me all about it, I'm excited to have James Carey, co-owner of Carey Brothers Remodeling, on today's show. James, welcome to the show. Thanks, Peggy. Great to be with you. So, James, tell me all about the Carey Brothers and when you guys really kind of fell in love with remodeling. You guys are doing such beautiful homes today. Thank you so much. Uh, my brother and I are third-generation contractors. He started in construction for our uncle in about 1976. I joined him in 1981, and we've been working together ever since. And now doing that, talk a little bit about where you're doing this, you know, the location, and now that you guys are working together. I mean, how is it like, one, working with your brother, and two, the types of homes that you're rebuilding and remodeling, I should say, and really enjoying that in, in the communities that you're doing? We are a design, build, remodeling contractor. Our business is in the East Bay in the San Francisco Bay Area. Soon we'll be celebrating our 40th year together. I don't know how that happened, but uh, I was six when we started, by the way. Uh, Go he's with 12 that. Years, he's the oldest of four children. I'm the youngest. He's 12 years older. Uh, it's been a marvelous journey. Uh, of course, we've seen several recessions together. We've managed to survive those. We love what we do and uh, just want to keep doing it as long as we possibly can. So talk about that. Instead of tearing things down, you guys love to really get the beauty of them. And I think that's what's nice about it is rebuilding the structures and making them anew. Why do you want to do that? I mean, and it's fun. You've got an older brother working with a younger brother. There's a lot of kind of creativity there. 12 years apart, I love that. I mean, kind of like when I look at it, I've got an older sister. I'm the youngest in the family. You kind of work together. I love that kind of thought process. Tell me why you do that. You know, we were raised in a home that was built by our grandfather in 1911. Uh, at any given time, there were three or four generations in that home, our grandmother, our great-grandmother. And in the early 70s, the community decided that the home needed to go along with many, many other homes because of something called urban renewal. And our mom was born in that home. And when that home was lost, a, a part of us was lost. So we find our, our journey remodeling homes, especially one that we recently completed, which was a 111-year-old uh, historic renovation, that we can uh, uh, vicariously experience remodeling the old family home by doing these things. It's always been a fascination for us, for me in particular. I can recall uh, applying a coat of red paint to that front porch, porch paint, when I was just seven or eight years old, and I was so moved at what a marvelous transformation I made that I was hooked at that very moment. And uh, I'm always, 
still today, I'm fascinated to see a space converted. And uh, it's marvelous. Now, there has to be, I mean, the joy of that is exciting, just to see you bring new life to some of these old structures. But there's got to be some hurdles you have to overcome. I assume you're dealing with things like asbestos. I mean, older homes, we didn't know about some of the things we have. And, and you find a lot of mystery when you're taking and rebuilding and re looking at these older structures. There's things you don't know what you're going to uncover. You know, you have termites and things you probably never imagined in some of these older homes. But then when you bring them to life, and you bring these new beauty into these older structures, it, it has to be exciting like you're describing, but there's hurdles along the way, right? Uh, Peggy, there are hurdles and you're right. Some of them have to do with the potential dangers if they're uh, lead or asbestos that need to be you know, properly identified and abated. Uh, that, that's um, with what we do. But yes, that's true. Acoustic ceilings, for example, heat ducts, uh, furnace wrap, uh, uh, vinyl floor tiles. Uh, these are things that are a particular concern. Um, the other is what you mentioned, termite damage. The little 111-year-old home that we just completed, which was a nine-month project, that was nine months, and it was a year in design and entitlement. So these don't move fast for us, and we don't push. It's like wine. When it's right, it's right. So the, the project that we took on, once we began to remove interior finishes, we discovered that studs were at four feet on center rather than 16 inches. We discovered that rafters needed to be supported. We discovered that ceiling joists needed to be added. Uh, there was, of course, we knew uh, no shear ply, no earthquake proofing, and you can imagine how important that might be in the San Francisco Bay Area. Are you using technology along the way to help you guys do some of the things? I mean, there has to be some really great highlights. You're talking about nine months in, in development. There's got to be some things now you have to use to help you complete some of these projects, I would assume. Well, I think we try and harness technology uh, in any way that we can. I mean, we're experiencing technology at this moment. You're in one part of the country. I'm in another part of the country. Formerly, we couldn't do this. I'd have to jump on a plane and be in studio with you. We see more and more even network television using this technology. We're using similar technology as we visit our projects on a daily basis through um, uh, video conferencing. We can meet with our clients. Uh, some of our clients are overseas, and we share what we're doing on our projects. And as much as technology is concerned with regard to the design, you bet we use state-of-the-art design. We do our 2D design. We convert the 2D design into 3D. We do a virtual reality so that our clients can experience the space before the first nail is driven and they can walk through the space, look at the ceiling heights, look at the crown mold detail, look at the window detail, uh, right down to the uh, architectural baseboard finish and, and door casings and doors and door hardware, plumbing fixtures. It really gives us an advantage and helps our clients have a, a very a keen understanding of what it is we propose to do to their home so that they can weigh in on the design and make changes again before we begin to disrupt the existing. James, thank you for being with us today. <laughs> it was my pleasure, Peggy. Anytime. Thank you. Well, we enjoyed it. Sounds like you have a great, 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 exciting time doing all these great projects. So thank you so much. That's James Carey, who's the co-owner of Carey Brothers Remodeling. We appreciate all your time today. And that's Someone You Should Know. About 13% of all energy produced in the United States today is used to heat, cool, and ventilate buildings. And much of it is being wasted. And it is used when buildings are unoccupied. Purdue University is leading a U.S. Department of Energy project, and that is developing sensors to reduce the cost of a building's HVAC system. And it is designed to determine how many people are occupying a room or building by measuring changes in carbon dioxide concentration.
Here to tell me all about it is Jeffrey Rhodes, professor at Purdue University. Jeff, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me today. So Jeff, let's talk about the sensor program and the goals that you've set for it. Sure, so I think uh, RPE has a really commendable program here. The idea is, is to try to come up with sensors to count occupants in rooms and buildings. And the idea is, is if we can count those people and tell when a room is occupied, we can adjust the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning in that room uh, so that when it's when the room's not occupied, it's shut off. You can imagine we can save a lot of energy in buildings by doing that. So how are you actually going to achieve that? There has to be really some real technical challenges behind that. There is. So, I mean, we're trying to detect the presence of someone from CO2, right? When we exhale, we put carbon dioxide in the room. So it's a non-invasive way to tell if the room is occupied is to measure that quantity. And then we can actually put in dampers at the HVAC inlets in a room and turn them off uh, when the room's not occupied. And so now we're not going to be heating and cooling spaces when there's not someone in the room. Are we talking about a lot of money being saved? Are we talking about a sustainability kind of approach? What, what are the two things or are there more, multiple objectives with it? I think there are multiple objectives, right? So I think the country could save something like 30% of energy consumption in buildings by using this approach is what the Department of Energy, I believe, estimates. But I think at a local level, right, we could see savings because these are relatively low cost things to retrofit, relatively easy to put in new construction buildings. And, you know, just simple dampers, if you would, could really uh, lead to direct savings on monthly bills. So are you looking then for this, as you just described, it would be for retrofits, new construction? How are you approaching this then? I think really both. I think the program's goal is to have a good technology at the end of three years that can be put in buildings. And so new construction might be a principal target. But you can imagine with uh, the amount of energy savings that there, we estimate these could have, that it might be worth retrofitting buildings as well. How does the research you're doing here differ than some of the other traditional research you've been doing? So there, uh, you know, there are a number of CO2 sensors on the market, but one of the things that my group does is we try to go in spaces where people have maybe come up with super high-tech solutions and come up with lower-cost practical engineering solution variants to those. And so one of the things we try to do is make sure we transition technologies uh, you know, from the laboratory to practice. And so we've done some of that work for the Department of Defense in the past. We've done work for an explosive sensing in the past for building protection. And really now we're trying to get into a, a different and bigger market, which is the smart and sustainable buildings area. And looking at that right now and the success that you see that you're having with this and looking at the sensor market, it's really blossoming. I mean, this is really a high growth area that we're seeing right now in the digitization when we talk about the Internet of Things. Yeah, you are absolutely right. I think the Internet of Things has a lot of potential. And one of the challenges is how to leverage that for practical gain. Uh, it's very easy to put sensors on everything, right? And so we need to find ways that are sensible, where the sensing solutions are kind of streamlined, can be well integrated to leverage existing infrastructure and really make a difference. Uh, and so I think this is one target area where we have the tremendous opportunity to impact energy consumption around the United States. So who's going to be retrieving this type of information, the real-time information that comes off of these? The facility managers, the, the owners, what are we talking about here? Well, I think certainly facility managers can, can leverage the data and use it directly if they'd like. But our hope is to actually feed these into automated building control systems. And so it's somewhat transparent to the building operator. You know, just this ability, uh, much like different sorts of uh, monitoring that we do now, right, this ability to have it done automated, I think, is where the real potential comes. And looking at that right now, that's what we're going to see in a lot of construction going forward, is sensors are going to change the way buildings and information is obtained in those buildings, right? Is that the ultimate goal when you're doing projects like this? I couldn't agree more. I think, you know, when we see the sensor revolution that's happening around the world, we see it in things like small appliances and handheld electronics now. But in some ways, the impact that they can have in that space is minimal. When we think about things that consume a lot of energy, cost a lot of money to build and maintain, Right, those are the spaces where sensors can make a big difference. So it could be residential and commercial buildings. It could be civil infrastructure. Those are the places where I think sensors are going to make a big difference in the next decade. So do we have to get the construction companies as well uh, to start thinking differently? The owners, uh, the HVAC manufacturers, everybody to think differently about what sensors can do when we're building infrastructure and new projects? I think so. I mean, we can think about ways that sensors can save energy. We can think about ways that sensors can help schedule maintenance. And so we're doing it on an as-needed basis rather than a preventative basis. 
So I think there are a lot of opportunities if we change our mindset to leverage sensors in the field. Now, Purdue does a lot of amazing projects. How does this fit into that framework of all the other things that you've been doing? Right, so Purdue is the home for the Center for High Performance Buildings, which is kind of a leader in the field of trying to take modern technologies, research technologies, and pushing out to the broader HVAC and our industries. And so we really think this streamlines lines in with a new thrust we have in the center, which is really focused on sensors and sensor integration in companies to put that into their products, but also non-traditional and startup companies uh, to leverage these and make sure that they get market penetration. Well, I have to tell you, Jeff, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much for being with us. And thank you for having me. And that's Jeff Rhodes, the professor at Purdue University, and that's our Learn It for today. Today's word of the day is cybersecurity. Now, I'm sure many of you have heard of the target cyber breach that made everyone kind of take notice of cyber attacks. But did you know that the cyber breach came as a result of malware being infiltrated on an HVAC contractor? Cybersecurity at its most basic level is a set of techniques used to protect networks, programs, and even data from an attack. Now, currently, if you think about it, there's a war being waged in the digital world. Black hat hackers are violating computer security really for personal gain. For a lack of a better word, these are the bad guys or those bad actors out there, and they're looking to get all of your personal data, all your enterprise information, and they're pretty much doing a good job of it. And we have recently heard of data breaches from Panera Bread, Saks Fifth Avenue, Lord & Taylor, Under Armour, the list goes on and on. And we've also heard of a number of data breaches at construction companies. No one is really immune. For example, back in 2015, employees at a very large construction company were exposed in a data breach. The company alerted the IRS and took the proper steps to resolve the problem. But this is only one example. I've spoken with a number of CIOs from construction companies across the country that have experienced similar situations. According to Identity Theft Research Center, there were 250 data breaches between January 1st and March 27th. More than 5.4 million records have been exposed. And that's just this year alone. Now, there's some good news here. This is below last year's total of 392 during the same period. This is why you need to invest in cybersecurity systems where white hackers, they actually come into the equation. Now, a white hat hacker specializes in ensuring the safety and security of an organization's IT systems. These are the good guys. They are skilled to help protect your data. They have all of the strategy and tactics to help you be proactive. Now, there's a battle, if you think about it, being waged to protect your data that is currently taking place. And cybersecurity is the necessary tool for construction that is going to help win that war. Cybersecurity, that's your word of the day. And make sure to like, share, and subscribe. And thanks for watching Construct Tech TV where we are talking tech at the job site.